today we want to finish our the the first module uh, on background and authority of the Bible, our first six lessons. This is lesson six, uh, titled "Textual Criticism and Modern Translations." We're building on what Rick did with us last lesson as we began to talk about that. And so, by way of introduction, you recall that we have seen that God has preserved for us an inspired, inerrant, and authoritative text. However, it is a text uh, contained in thousands of copies. I think Rick mentioned uh, there's over 5,000 copies that need to be evaluated to determine and get back to the original reading. And once the original reading has been determined, the text must then be translated into our language. Um, and this lesson speaks to these issues. By way of overview, we want to build on what uh, we had in Lesson 5, talk more about our modern translations of the Bible. Uh, we will begin with the King James Bible. I think that's where we left off last time, and then discuss revisions to the King James Bible, as well as other modern translations uh, like what I use, the New American Standard, and others that are very good. We're also going to talk about the importance of textual criticism. And this is not a um, uh, something we want to... We'll bring this up later. <laughs> um, textual criticism, and that's our exercise for later. But the bottom line is, it's, it's examining the text that we have and making decisions concerning what would have been the original autograph, the original text. So we want to talk about that. You need to be aware of that because sometimes people use that to say that the, how can the Bible be inerrant when there's uh, mistakes in the Bible or things like that. We're going we're gonna to mention that. So let's begin with this King James debate. Uh, as we begin to talk about the King James Bible and other modern translations, it's important to be reminded that they are just that. They're translations, people. Uh, God in His providence, as we have seen, has preserved His Word for us in the original languages in which the autographs were written. You remember the autograph is the original letter or bo uh, uh, writing that the author penned, like Paul with Romans. There was an original letter. That's the autograph. And then it was copied after Paul wrote the original autograph, as we say. So we want to remember that we have translations, copies, and translations from that original. Yet, because the majority of English speakers don't know Hebrew or Aramaic or Greek, uh, we're dependent upon gifted men to translate God's Word from that original language into English uh, for us. Uh, and I believe, and this is important, that we would all agree that we want an English Bible that as much as possible reflects manuscripts that are as close to the original autograph as possible. In other words, the most accurate text that we can have in our hands we want. So we want to have uh, get back to those original readings if, if possible. Uh, this issue of the accuracy of the manuscripts from which the English translation is made is at the heart of this King James Version debate. The accuracy of the text into which the King James Bible was translated into English. So um, maybe you've heard, probably you have, maybe some of you haven't, but uh, in, in the history of the church and even today in the United States, many churches believe that the King James Version is the authorized version, the only English Bible you can use, and, and they defend that uh, vehemently. And, and we don't want to cause dispersion upon that, but we want you to think biblically and accurately about the translation you have. And so we want to discuss the reasons for this, <clears throat> viewing it this way. And there are fundamentally two ideas that are promoted. Uh, and this is pointed out by Wegner in his very good book. And the first reason is, he, and I'm quoting him, those who believe that it is the only authoritative text, this is, and that it has been preserved by God through the ages. So they're saying that the English King James is the only authoritative text preserved by God through the ages. That's the first point 
that they make. A second point of argument is this. Those who argue that the text of the King James Version preserves, they say it preserves the original Greek text better than does any other version. So let's just talk about that a little bit. Um, it's important to understand these ideas. Concerning the first point that we mentioned, um, that it is the only authoritative text preserved by God through the ages, we would argue that God's authority is directly associated with the inspired original autographs. We've talked about the doctrine of inspiration. It's attached not to the copies, but to the original autographs. That's where the authority rests. And then with the accurate copies of those autographs, which he has preserved. We talked about the doctrine of God's preserving his word for us throughout the centuries. To the degree that we have an accurate translation that comes from manuscripts as close to the originals as possible, to that degree we can say we have God's authoritative word. Does, does that make sense to you? I hope so. Authority then does not reside with any particular English uh, rendering of the original languages, but with an accurate translation of a text reflecting the originals as much as possible. That's very important, and that deals with that first idea that it's, it has that kind of authority. It does not by, uh, in, in how we define these things. Second point, that uh, the King James Version preserves the original Greek text better than does any other version, Let's make a few comments about that. Uh, and Rick pointed some of these things out last time very, very well. The King James Version was based uh, upon Erasmus's Greek New Testament, which used about six manuscripts, six manuscripts, none earlier than the 10th century. Um, that comes from Wegner. This Greek text later became known as the Textus Receptus. Uh, which does not mean received from God, but don't, denotes the standard text of the 17th century, Erasmus's text. Now, you might be already thinking, wow, uh, six texts, none earlier than the 10th century? Oh, that may be a problem, and I think it is. Uh, following the publishing of the King James Version then, uh, as Rick mentioned, a number of significant Greek manuscripts older than those used to translate the King James Version were discovered. They were discovered after uh, it was translated. These include the Vatican Manuscript, the Sinaitic Manuscript, the Alexandrian Manuscript, all those things, those manuscripts described in Lesson 5, and you can go back to your lesson and refer to the history of those texts and how they were discovered. Uh, this, the discovery then of these older manuscripts dating closer to the original autographs gave scholars uh, something to compare with the Textus Receptus, Erasmus's text, and evaluate its accuracy. Under God's providence, these discoveries then uh, contributed significantly to having a Greek text of the New Testament that more accurately reflects the original autographs. So, just to conclude, then, the reality of these discoveries and, and others cast doubt upon the statement that the King James Version preserves the original Greek text better than does any other, and certainly authority does not rest, as we said, with the English uh, translation.